Hey guys, it's Landon Blake from Refine Horizons. Uh, I wanted to do a couple videos about boundary surveying, some, some topics I've had on my list to cover with you guys. It won't be long videos. Um, this, neither one of these videos are, I, I wouldn't call them entry level, so they're a little more nuanced, um, maybe for a little more advanced uh, surveyor, uh, you know, like an LSIT level. Uh, you're welcome to watch them even if you're if you're a student or just starting out, but they they do deal with subject matter that's a little more complex. Um, so I just want to get that out in front. I don't want to confuse students or or, or new surveyors. Um, and I haven't forgotten about Brown's <laughs> boundary control. I'm going to get back to Brown's. I know I need to do a couple more videos on the book Brown's boundary control and legal principles. So I haven't forgot that. So and I I should be typing this in. These should be articles I'm writing, but I type too much and my my tendons start to bother me. So you, just, you guys just get videos. All right, so this first video I want to talk about um, this topic. The problem isn't conflicting evidence; it's a lack of evidence. And I, I won't, the reason I want to do this video is I think there's a major mismatch between what we we teach surveyors, kind of textbook boundary surveyors and what, what they find in the real world, at least in the part of the world where I practice, this could be different in other parts of the world or other parts of the United States, but I, I think it's pretty common around the United States. And so what do we teach surveyors about evidence? You know, one of the main things we teach them is the rules of conflicting evidence. And there's a list of rules. You can find them in Brown's boundary control. So I'll give an example. So uh, one of those rules is natural monuments control over art artificial monuments. So, for example, the center of, of a stream would control over a, a rock pile set in the stream. So, art, uh, natural monuments control over artificial. Another uh, example of a rule uh, that of those rules is that monuments control over bearings and distances. So, a call for a pipe or a rebar would, would control over a call for a bearing of di or distance. That's what we call controlling calls. Um, so it's it's kind of the order of controlling calls, the, the hierarchy uh, of, of controlling elements. It's called controlling calls or controlling elements. So that's what we, you know, we spend a fair amount of time um, teaching surveyors those rules of conflicting evidence and testing their knowledge of those rules. And it's, I'm not saying those rules aren't important. You need to understand them. Uh, they are important. But I think it, we, we spend time teaching surveyors those rules. And in my opinion... <laughs> Those, I rarely apply those rules in my actual practice. The, the problem I face all the time is not that I have conflicting evidence, it's that I have no or little evidence of the boundary location. So it's kind of funny to me that we spend all this time teaching surveyors about the rules of conflicting evidence, but we, we basically don't teach them anything about what to do when you, when you find very little evidence. Um, but there's some other problems with these rules. So, so let, me talk about the, let me talk about those for a minute. And I have uh, four. So, if you actually study common law, what you learn in the common law and case law is that uh, the intent of the parties is really the most important thing. So we have those rules about order of controlling elements, but they're subject to the intent of the parties. In other words, if you can prove or you understand that the, the party intended for the artificial monument to hold over the natural monument or the distance to hold uh, over the, the bearing or whatever it is, um, you know, the distance to hold over the call for a monument. If you can prove that that was the intent of the parties, then the courts are going to hold the intent of the parties in, in the majority of the cases. Uh, so that's one problem with those rules. You can't just teach a surveyor those rules and then not teach him about the intent of, par of the parties to the, to the land transaction or the parcel creation. The intent of the parties is paramount, and, and the courts have told us that. Um, the other thing is you can't just follow those rules blindly uh, the real world is complex. Circumstances and context is important. Um, and that the problem with giving somebody a set of rules is then they just blindly follow the rules and they've switched their brain off. The rules are important, but they have to be applied with nuance in a complicated world. You have to think about history and background and, and circumstances. Um, and so I'll give you a quick example, and this is because it comes from case law. So in surveying, we have this concept of original monuments. I talk about that. Um, in some other videos, but basically original monuments are monuments set and called for on the document that creates the parcel, either a map or a deed. But think about this kind of nuanced example for a minute. So you've got a, a, a subdivision map that's filed, an older subdivision map, let's say, that the map doesn't show any monuments, but we know from historical evidence 
that a week after the subdivision map was filed, the original subdivider, before he sold the lots, went out and monumented the corners of the subdivision. And all the deeds that were then used to sell those lots in the subdivision refer to those monuments. We know that the landowners in the neighborhood held those monuments and built their fences using those monuments. Then the courts have said, hey, even though they didn't actually appear on the subdivision map, we're going to treat them like their original monuments because that was the intent of the parties and that's how they've been used. That's a nuance. See, a strict application of the rules is, is not appropriate there, right? You have to understand the circumstances. So that's, that's a, another thing we have to keep in mind. Then the last thing we talked about a little bit, but that's, you know, often the problem with those rules is we don't have, we don't have conflicting evidence. We have a lack of evidence. Now, there are, there are times when you will find conflicting evidence. I'll give you an example. You've got a distance between two monuments that doesn't match uh, the record. That is an example of, of, a, of, a, of a conflict. So you've got a distance there, maybe a distance called for in the deed. It doesn't fit the monuments on the ground. In theory, the monuments on the ground should control, and in most cases, they will. Uh, so we do find that occasionally. That's probably the most common type of conflict I find is a distance that doesn't match uh, monuments on the ground. Uh, sometimes you'll find what we call a pincushion, so you'll have multiple monuments set in a small area to mark one corner. I have seen that occasionally. I'll be honest, I don't see it very much. Um, other surveyors seem to, to, to find it more than I do. Uh, but So it's not that conflicting evidence doesn't happen. It does happen, um, and you need to know how to deal with it. But a much larger problem in my practice in my part of California is just the lack of evidence. And what do you do? What do you do when you lack evidence? So that's what I want to I want to talk a little bit about. So why do we have this problem with, with missing evidence of boundary locations? Why is it, it like it's a scourge? It's a scourge of my it's a plague of my surveying practice. So there's a there's a number of reasons. I'll give you four. Um, this isn't a comprehensive list, but uh, we do a small number of surveys compared to the, the number of land transactions. I don't know what the actual percentage is. Maybe it's I was less than 5%, 1%, 2%, 3% of all land transactions get a survey. Some of some of those surveys aren't filed. Uh, so we have a small number of surveys compared to the amount of land transactions. I talk about that in another video. I talk about the three myths that real estate professionals believe about boundary surveys. And one of the myths is that everything gets a survey. Eh, everything doesn't get a survey. So that's a problem. Uh, lots of boundary surveyors don't set monuments um, and a lot of clients don't want to pay for it. Uh, I have another video that talks about the parcel map with no monuments. You can watch that. It explains why that happens and, and what the problems are. But a lot of boundary surveyors that don't set monuments. And then another problem, the third, we destroy monuments all the time. Public agencies, when they maintain roads and sidewalks, will destroy monuments. And then uh, when, when we build on lots, when we build parking lots and block walls and fences and buildings, we destroy monuments. So lots of people destroy monuments. Um, we have rules to prevent that. Those are called monument preservation rules. That's, uh, but the rules are poorly enforced um, in many, many parts of the United States and here in California. You can tell you from experience, the rules are poorly enforced and monument preservation is widely ignored by the design professionals that we work with. Civil engineers, architects, uh, they just, they just, they don't pay a lot of attention. I, there are exceptions to that, but as a general rule, I can tell you from my practice, uh, engineers and architects do not want to hear about monument preservation. Uh, it's getting better. It's gotten better the last five years, uh, thanks to some efforts of, of people like Mike Cotaroli and others. Uh, but it, it's a challenge still. So though, that's why a lot of times when I go out to do a boundary survey, I might be looking for 15 corners. I might only find one or two. Some surveys, I don't find any corners. So what does this mean? Well, you know, What does that mean for the modern boundary surveyor, this lack of evidence that we have? So I'm going to give you five things I think it means. So number one, as a land surveyor, you got to learn how to use physical occupation. That's important. I'm not saying you can do that blindly. Don't just go out there and start to survey fences and hold fences. But you need to understand when it's appropriate to do that. You, you need to know a little bit about fences and walls and ditches where, where I practice. And you need to talk to landowners about that occupation. You need to ask some questions. That means your boundary survey is harder to do, right? You can't just go out and hold a, cor hold a corner monument. You actually have to look at occupation. You have to survey the occupation. You have to analyze that evidence. You have to talk to some landowners. You have to see if evidence has been shown on 
if you have to see if evidence of occupation has been shown on past surveys. So learn how to use physical occupation. Understand how to split curbs in a, in a downtown area. I have an article about that. I'm going to do a video on it based on that article, but you need to know how to do that. Learn about the intent of parties. Read the case law that talks about that. Understand how, how courts will look at Look for the intent of parties and how they will apply it and think about, think about that when you're doing a boundary survey. Um, think about how you can avoid upending the neighborhood. You know, a lot of surveys go in, there's, there's a lack of evidence, they just start holding record measurements and they're calling off a bunch of fences and a bunch of boundaries and Brett Setness, you know, I wanted to do that all the time as a young surveyor. Brett Setness told me not to do that. He taught, he taught me that. It was a very valuable lesson. Um, you know, I try and hold existing monuments or occupation if it's reasonable to do that, given the evidence and, and, the, and the circumstances. Can't always do that. Sometimes fences are off. I had a survey I did. Uh, we actually found some monuments on this survey, and the, I had a fence that one fence was 55 feet off and another fence was 32 feet off. Um, so that happens. I, I'm not going to hold a fence in that situation. Uh, but there might be some situations in, in rural San Joaquin County or Stanislaus County where I I might hold a fence that was 30 feet off the record measurement, depending on the character of the fence and when I thought it was built and how it's been used and relied on. So, uh, you know, try not to up in the neighborhood if you can. Under the Understand the implication of the lack of monuments that we have. Um, it has consequences. So um, you got to know about unwritten rights because unwritten rights uh, develop more frequently when, when you are working in an area that lacks monuments. And you also need to understand encroachments and how to deal with encroachments and how to identify encroachments. Encroachments occur more frequently in an area that lacks monuments. So part of being a good boundary surveyor is knowing about unwritten rights and encroachments. And then do your part as a boundary surveyor to pr preserve evidence for future surveyors. Don't just worry about the map. Worry about evidence. Think about how you can pr preserve evidence. That means you file your maps, file your records of survey, take good notes, put good notes on your maps. Practice monument preservation. Teach your design professionals that you work with about monument preservation. Rehab monuments when you have the opportunity. You know, if you showed that mon, if you, you you surveyed that monument, found a monument, and surveyed it, but you didn't use it on your boundary resolution, show it on your survey anyways, so that I know you were there, and I know when you were there, and I know what you found. That's preservation of evidence is really important. Set monuments when you do boundary surveys. I know you can't always do that. You don't always get paid for it, but you, I always try and encourage my clients to do that. I've had clients that have told me that other boundary surveyors have encouraged them not to set monuments because they don't want they don't want to pay the cost and they don't want to have to file the record of survey here in California. That's a horrible crime. Surveyors should be executed for that. Um, I always encourage my my clients to set monuments. They don't always want to do that. They don't always want to pay for it, but I but I encourage it. And there are some things they will not do without monuments. I will not do a subdivision, a modern subdivision without uh, monument placement because I just think it's really bad practice. So there you go. Sometimes the problem isn't conflicting evidence. Know those rules. Know the rules for conflicting evidence that we're talking grounds and understand them, but also know how to deal with a lack of evidence and understand that these rules are not always black and white and there's some nuance involved there. Read some case law. Um, teach yourself about that. Teach yourself about the intent of parties. We'll do some more videos about how you deal with lack of evidence. Maybe I'll use some, some examples from my own practice. Thanks for watching.